ladies and gentlemen, Tim Merrill. Hello. Um, greetings from the West Coast. Sorry I can't be with you today, um, but I'll do my best from over here. I'm going to take myself off the screen uh, so I can show you some stuff on screen. Now, at DigiCapital, we're an AR and VR advisor. We do four things. Uh, we have our analytics platform that I'll use today to talk to you about where the market's been and where it's going. Um, our reports, the latest one we published today, and it's 313 pages long. So if you like number, data, and charts, it's a pretty good read. Strategy consulting, everywhere from large corporates, helping them to navigate the market, figure out how to leverage it, and startups figuring out how to grow faster uh, and sometimes taking advisory board roles. And lastly, investment banking. It's helping large corporates to acquire startups and startups to sell themselves to large corporates. My own background, uh, I'm a software engineer, investment banker and lawyer. So I approach this from the creative engineering aspect as well as um, from the, the hard numbers side of things. Now, what you're going to see today is DigiCapital's analytics platform. It's got over half a million data points in it. Um, and what you're seeing is a demo version. So you won't see the charts, data, and axes that you get in the full subscription version. If that's of interest, please feel free to reach out after the conference. In terms of, of what we're going to look at today, it's really looking at platforms, so hardware sales and hardware and software installed bases, revenue from total revenue down to all the detailed granular revenue streams, an ecosystem, leaders, valuations, investments, investors, and deal flow. So I'll start by skipping over hardware sales and going straight to hardware and software installed base. The first thing you see is this big blue bar, and that's mobile AR. Now, by the end of last year, that reached 850 million installed base. Now, that doesn't mean active users. It means the number of devices that are configured that are capable of running it. And that should reach around 2.5 billion in five years' time. If we back out of that and just go to look at the headset market and look at smart glasses and VR, it's quite a different picture. Here we've seen, well, basically install base actually slightly declining because of mobile VR, um, which should return to growth really next year and then possibly hit an inflection point in 2020, 21, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, I guess the obvious question is, you know, where's all this data come from? Um, we get all our data directly from companies themselves and from reliable secondary sources. So if you look at, say, PlayStation VR, there we get numbers directly from Sony in terms of sales. And also we've got very good solid data again from Sony in terms of attachment and attrition rates. So it gives us a very solid basis for both historic and forecast numbers. And actually our forecasts have been bang on in terms of where the market's been. If we back out of that and look at mobile IR, we get, we, we have again directly from Apple and Google, uh, the, um, uh, Basically, the take-up rates for new versions of iOS and Android. We have compatibility by device. For iOS, it's quite easy. For Android, it's a little bit harder. Um, but more importantly, we get configuration directly from the phone makers so that we know which devices are configured. And that's where, for instance, where before it looked like AR Core might pass AR Kit uh, really going into next year, it now looks like it's going to take until 2021 to pass it, which has serious implications for the overall scale of the market. So that's installed bases. Now let's look at revenue. The first thing you see is AR, so mobile AR and smart glasses, outpacing VR by a large margin. Um, basically, we're looking at an 80 to 90 billion market in five years' time versus a 10 to 15 billion market. So very, very different. But then really, that's the top level. You need to understand business models. And here you can see everything from hardware to app store to e-commerce and so on. But really, you know, that's only the, the, the start of the picture. To really understand it, you need to dig, dig into the individual platform. So let's start with mobile AR. And here at the business model level, you see a few things. The first thing you see is that really App Store, driven by um, Pokemon Go, not surprisingly, drove things early on, is still a big part of the market. But going forward, we anticipate e-commerce sales, where folks like House have already demonstrated 11 times sales uplift using mobile IR to be the largest revenue stream, followed by advertising, particularly on the social platforms like Instagram and, and so on, and then App Store. Um, now within App Store, we'll come back to what actually drives App Store in a minute. If we then back out of that and look at smart glasses, you get a very different picture. And here what you're looking at is 
really modest growth so far in the marketplace, mainly hardware and enterprise. What we've been forecasting since 2016 is Apple launching smartphone tethered smart glasses towards the back end of next year. Now, if that happens, that could be AR and VR's inflection point. That could be the thing that really drives the market and could see the total market being dominated by hardware sales and enterprise. Everything else is relatively small because of the simple, the install base is not going to be huge and unit economics are what they are. Lastly, looking at VR, again, we get a different picture. And here what we're looking at is, so far it's been hardware and app store, primarily games, and going forward, app store even bigger in terms of dropping prices than hardware. Some enterprise, folks like Striver with Walmart, and a few other bits around location-based entertainment and video. But really, again, this is only at the top level. The first thing you need to do is get a better handle on what this looks like when it comes to the individual markets. And there isn't really a global market for this stuff. It's a bunch of individual country markets. And again, what you see initially, obviously, is, is China leaps out as being the largest market overall, followed by the States. But when you add, actually add up all the major Asian markets, Asia could be larger than Europe and North America combined in five years' time. So a huge market which folks have to pay attention to. But again, this is still only the top level, so let's dive in a little bit deeper. If we look at app stores, and we'll start by looking at, rather than just the aggregate AR and VR market, again, let's look at mobile AR. Here what we see is that, so far, games are dominated. And we still see games as being the largest single category going forward. But in five years' time, given the proliferation of different business models, different app types, we think that non-games apps could take a bit over half of the total revenue for the market. But you know, let's work through an example and look at what this might look like and how you might practically use this sort of information. So let's say you were a mobile AR education app developer and you were based here in the States. And you're thinking, okay, well, how big is my market? Let's say I can take 10% of revenue this year. What's that look like? Well, we forecast the total addressable market for mobile AR education apps in North America, 9.6 million. So 10% of that isn't a lot of money. Obviously, if you're trying to build a team, you need more. So what do you do? Well, the, the obvious thing is you think, okay, I'm gonna to go to Europe. That's the easy one to do. So if we add in Europe, the first thing you see is there isn't any, really any such thing as a European market. There are lots of individual country markets. So you can't do Europe. So you've got to pick off, initially the easy way to do it is to pick off individual language markets. So let's say you're going to do the English speaking markets and also the German speaking markets. So you're going to do Austria, Germany, Ireland, Switzerland, and the UK. So how big is your addressable market this year now? Now, okay, 14.7, so a bit bigger, but still it's not really gonna, gonna actually make that big of a difference. So the next thing we need to look at is Asia, and that's really where you start to see scale benefits coming in. So let's back out of that, add in North America. And again, Asia, you can't really do it as a single market. You really need to be able to do individual country markets. So let's say you were just looking at the major markets of China, Japan, and let's add in South Korea. So, okay, before we had 10-ish for the US, 14 and a bit for uh, US and Europe, if we had in Asia, just China, Japan, and South Korea, we're now looking at over 30 million. So you're starting to get to larger addressable market. Now, of course, you need partners to do it, and you probably still need to raise VC money, but again, now you actually have granular information on your products and services in your markets, in your countries and regions, and so you can have that credible discussion rather than saying it's going to be an X billion market, which doesn't mean anything for VCs. You can talk in detail. Again, jumping on, if you look at, say, e-commerce, again, you get a different flavor of things. So if we look at how that market breaks out rather than the 23 app store categories, now you have all of the categories of products and services that people sell from cars to clothing to toys. And again, you can look at how that breaks out geographically. So that you can see, okay, well, if I'm in, if I'm selling one particular sort of thing using mobile AR, then you know, in Portugal, this is how much I'm looking at this year. You start to get to more granular detail for your country rollouts and so on. Then, looking more broadly, uh, we can look again at ad, ad spend, advertising, and here 
different categories again in terms of the major advertiser categories, whether it be automotive or entertainment or consumer electronics. And again, it gives you the ability, you need to be able to dig into your specific markets because what's happened so far in the market is people have had a lot of blue sky, a lot of hand waving, a lot of good thoughts, but now there's really granular data and you need that really for the next stage of the market. Gut feel isn't enough. The last piece I'm going to dig in on revenue is enterprise. And here we really see smart classes as being the driver for enterprise long term. There's some VR as well. And again, it comes back to when's the inflection point. Now, we saw some, a little bit of growth last year. We expect some more growth this year. Again, we see that inflection point potentially being at, towards the end of next year. If Apple launches smartphone tethered smart classes, you've got Microsoft doing great guns. They've got the military contract, which is wonderful. But if you start to get smartphone tethered smart classes being used by senior executives in companies, you start to get to bring your own device sort of demand on IT departments. And we think for smart classes, that could be the inflection point for enterprise in a similar way that to what it's been for mobile more broadly. Now, the last piece we're going to dig into is looking at the, the ecosystem itself. So we'll look into the um, uh, leaders board and see who the, the big companies are. Now, we've got thousands of companies in here by category, stage, and geography. The first thing we normally find when we're talking particularly to startups is we'll ask them, so who are your competitors? And so what they'll do is they'll say, well, you know, we've got this competitor and that competitor and we're better than all of them. And then we generally show them this. And suddenly they find there are three or four competitors, usually either in Europe, in, the, in Israel, or in China, they've never heard of, who might be doing exactly the same thing, who might be doing it better than them, and more importantly, may actually have VCs who've invested in them, who these guys are going to go and pitch their, their deck to, who will then take that pitch deck and give it directly to the portfolio company. So because there are so many investors out there and there's so many relationships and links, you need to understand this stuff. The next piece is valuation. Now, up until recently, it hasn't been possible to have a sensible discussion about valuation. There, wasn't, there weren't any metrics. Because our team has an investment banking background, we've done over 1,100 individual company valuations so that by category, stage, and country, you can actually value a deal. So if you were saying in the photo and video space and you were doing a seed round, you can see that the average is 11.5 million for the valuation at that stage. But that actually doesn't help you very much. If you're talking to a North American VC, then rather than looking at 11.5, now you're looking at 11.2, so a little bit lower. But let's say, given where the market's going, and we'll come back to deal flow in a second, you're talking to a Chinese VC. What's the average for them? Well, if we look at seed, it's 17.5. So the Chinese VCs are paying more for their deals. In other words, entrepreneurs are giving up less. So you need to understand the detailed metrics to understand who you're talking to and what their mental model is for valuation. Then, of course, there's all the investments. And again, we've got thousands of them tracked uh, globally, as well as over 1,400 individual investors, again, by category, stage, and country. So you get a feel for what's going on and who's doing what. And that's really where I want to finish up in terms of what's going on in the market around deal flow. And I'll start with deal volume, in other words, the number of deals. Down here, what you're seeing is the number of deals by category. What we saw last year over the first three quarters was a steady decline, about 10% a quarter, which has then stabilized at the end of last year. And if you look at where these deals were going on and what was happening to them, what we saw was that the squeeze was really around this big orange bar, which was seed deals. So seed deals are having about half the number that they were a, year, a couple of years ago. But if you look at pre-seed, so the really early stage stuff, it's running at a quarter of the level, whereas series A and further on, later deals, are not having as much trouble. So for very early stage companies, it's a harder fundraising market than it has been. But again, that doesn't really give you the full picture. That's the number of deals. But let's look at dollars, the actual money invested. So what you see is a pretty lumpy pattern. And there's actually a base load of about 300 to $500 million a quarter being invested into AI and VR. But we saw a bit over $2 billion invested at the end of 2017 and well over $2 billion invested in the third quarter of last year. But what's happening with this is we've seen a fundamental change in terms of what's happening in North America versus what's happening in China. And so let's look at the North American market. In the first three quarters of last year, we saw a dramatic decline where you had a bit over one and a half billion invested in US AR and VR companies. It dropped to less than 120 million in the third quarter. 
Unfortunately, it's stabilized, it's come back up. So it's looking a bit healthier. But when we then look at the Chinese market, we get a very, very different picture. And here you see a dramatic acceleration through the first three quarters of the year. Now it's having been as many big deals uh, in the last quarter, but there was over $6 billion invested into particularly AR crossing over into computer vision in companies like SenseTime, Megvi, many companies that folks in the West have never heard of. And so what's been happening, again, from talking to VCs here in Sand Hill Road, but also in China, American VCs have been waiting for mobile AR to get traction, and it takes time. And so somewhat counterintuitively, they've been taking a long-term solution to a short-term problem, and they haven't been investing as much, where the Chinese VCs have very much been investing in the future. Now, if we look at the market overall, and I'll wrap up on this, um, and this goes back to 2005, so I'll get to more recent data. Let's say you were going out to go and do a, a, a round and you thought Andreessen Horowitz was the investor for you. So because you like Mark Andreessen. So let's find Andreessen and see what the deal flow looks like. Now let's look at deal volume rather than value. So the first thing you see is they've done one or two deals a quarter at any time in history. So if they've already done a round this quarter, your chances are much lower. If they've done two rounds, your chances are pretty much zero. Now let's say you were looking at doing a series A. How many A rounds have they done? Well, actually, they've done three. So, you know, they're not really a big series A investor in this market. But let's say you still have thought they were the company for you. So how do you get to them? Well, if we have a look at their portfolio, we see that they invested in Probable, um, who've been in the news recently. So if we go back to the leaders board and see if we can find Improbable, hold on one sec. There we go. And we look, and if you know Herman or Rob, now you've got a chance of getting a warm introduction to Andreessen Horowitz. Um, and that's really how the platform works. That's what's going on in the market. Um, I know you're very pressed for time, so I won't take any questions now, uh, but feel free to reach out afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.